All right, well, you may be seated. Uh, kids, you guys can go ahead and go to your class. Thanks for worshiping with us. All right. Actually, uh, speaking of um, children, a uh, suppressed childhood memory uh, resurfaced this week as I was preparing for the sermon. Um, and it made me scream somewhat like that. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a suppressed memory of a cornfield. Uh, actually, more of a corn maze because I wasn't in a field. It was like uh, a bunch of walls and like corn stalks just maybe stapled or, or somehow placed upon the walls. And as you would go through this maze, there would be doors with exit signs just in case you couldn't make it all the way through. I guess it was a pretty serious maze. Um, so just in case you couldn't make it, you could go ahead and take the exit. Well, I would love to tell you that I made it all the way through to the end. Um, however, you don't usually suppress a memory of victory, right? So um, I did not make it through. Instead, uh, I couldn't find my way. I started getting extremely anxious. My anxiety started to raise as those walls seemed to be closing in. It started to get hot. I started to sweat. Uh, and then I started to get hungry, which you all know all bets are off. Uh, once that happens, I was like, okay, I'm just going to have to swallow my pride uh, and take that door. So there I, I went through the exit door, and there was this short little narrow hallway that led all the way back out to my family, which went, uh, then after that we went and I devoured an entire paper plate sized funnel cake, uh, which made the day amazing. So uh, remembered, uh, remembered the funnel cake, uh, not so much the maze. I actually don't go into mazes much anymore. And as much as I would love to try one of those um, escape rooms here in Wichita, an escape room, um, I'm, I'm a little bit terrified, to be, uh, to be honest. And I'm afraid that my anxiety would then come up and I'd just like bring the whole thing down like Samson, you know? Um, so although my history would argue against it, mazes and escape houses are not made in order to trap people in, right? Uh, they're made for you to enjoy finding your way out. See, if that was not the purpose, to get out, then it would be a jail cell, not an escape room. And this is close, maybe, perhaps, to the meaning of parables and the purpose of parables that Mark will highlight in today's passage. See, for many of us, uh, Jesus' teaching on parables, when we get to the parables in the Gospels, uh, our, our knees begin to shake, our palms get sweaty, uh, and, like a little kid in a corn maze. However, these sayings, which leave many in the dark, are actually meant to bring people to the end of the tunnel, if indeed they see the light. And I hope to show you this morning that that light is Jesus Christ himself and the key to understanding all of the parables. Thus, the sermon uh, is entitled this morning, Dark Sayings, The Lamp Has Come. So our passage today is in Mark 4, and you can turn your Bibles there, 4, 21 to 25. It's actually a continuation of Jesus' teachings on the parables uh, and to the multitudes, and then uh, escaping and, and privately teaching to the disciples, um, because they're really the only ones that stuck around. So just as a refresher, let's go ahead and paint the scene a little bit from last week, just to, uh, to remind us where we're at in the scriptures. So Mark 4, 1 to 3 shows us the scene. The scene is this, that Jesus began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and then the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Now, if you were here last week or are familiar with this passage, you know that Jesus goes on to tell of a parable of a sower where uh, he goes out and he sows some seeds. Some fall on a path where the birds just come and eat them all up, and some seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil to grow in. So it springs up really fast but didn't have roots that went down deep. So the sun comes out, scorches it, and it is no more. And then some seed, right, fall uh, yet next to thorns and weeds, so even as it grows, uh, thorns and, and thistles grow up and choke out that seed. But then uh, some of the seed falls on good soil, right? Uh, some of that good soil in which it grows, roots go down deep, and bears 30, 60, even 100-fold fruit for the sower. Now, the scene then changes, which is where I believe we're still at in our passage today in 421 to 25. 
The scene changes because all of the crowds that morning or maybe afternoon from the boat when Jesus was teaching to that large crowd, the crowd left. And after the crowd left, Jesus was alone. And then, while Jesus was alone, his disciples, his true followers, came to him asking him about those parables. Mark 4, 10 to 13 says that when he, Jesus, was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive. And they may indeed hear, which they did but did not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Now, right before our passage, Jesus does not leave them with this sort of rebuke. You don't understand the parables, but since they came and sought him out, those who followed him, even when the crowds left him, he actually gave them the meaning. For as we learned last week, it is the glory of God to conceal things and the glory of kings to search them out. And what were the disciples doing in this moment but going to Jesus in order to search out and understand those things of God that seem concealed? To bring to light those dark or mysterious sayings. See, Jesus in love then explains the meaning of the parable to his disciples and then says this, our passage, uh, this more proverbial saying about a lamp and a basket. So in our passage, Mark 4, 21 to 23, let's start there, says that Jesus then says to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. Nor is anything kept secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, here in Mark's explanation, uh, uh, showing Jesus, explaining to the disciples, he's explaining that uh, these things have been hidden, yes, but in order to be revealed. See, Mark, unlike Luke and Matthew, you see a a, a parallel in the other synoptic gospels. Mark focuses on the purpose of that which is concealed. What is the purpose? Why is it concealed? Referring to the parables themselves, though concealed now, it will not always be so. There are two purpose clauses in the Greek which emphasize the purpose of the things hidden. And then there's used the future tense, which we can see in the English, which emphasizes when those things would be revealed. So hidden now, but will be made manifest. In secret now, but it will come to light. Another way to say it is that you bury a treasure in order to one day dig it up, right? Or you put money into the vault in the bank, not so that it would always stay there, or else you might as well just throw it away if you're never going to use it, uh, if it's never to come out. Therefore, parables are told, yes, in order to conceal the truth for a time, but will one day fully be revealed and even being revealed as people are coming to the secret, the key of understanding, which is Jesus himself. Now to some, they don't come as further revelation. It comes as confusion. And to whom does it come confusion? But for those who are apart from Christ, those who have left him, those who are not following him, but it is coming as further revelation and understanding to those who are seeking him out, right? And for those who follow him, not only will they come to understand the parables of the kingdom of God, but they'll one day proclaim this mystery to all of the world. It shall be made manifest, be brought to light. So our passage tells us that these parables are being hidden so that they may be found and when discovered, proclaimed to all. But only those who have ears to hear will actually be the ones who will understand them. Lest hearing, but they, they'll hear, but they'll have no understanding. So what we need is ears to hear. Now this reminds me actually uh, about a month ago of the medallion hunt in Wichita. Anybody hunt for the medallion? Show of hands. Okay, we got, we got one. Well, yeah, it was uh, actually uh, Pastor Dave, our, our worship pastor, that was 
uh, came in one day, and also uh, Amanda Ward, she's our children's director, and they were sitting there talking about the hidden medallion, and that if they were to find the hidden medallion in Wichita, and there were a bunch of riddles each day that would come out, and you had to try to figure out the riddles, and if you were to figure them out, then you would get the huge prize. What was it, like a thousand dollars or something? Yeah, so big prize if you find it, but there's a bunch of riddles that you had to figure out. So there they are, they're kind of talking. Um, Dave was even uh, talking to his sister Laura, and they're talking, and I guess I didn't have ears to hear because all these riddles, I'm just sitting there like, I got no idea. Got my computer out, started Google searching, you know, uh, when in doubt, ask Google uh, or ask Jeeves. Uh, that, that might date me a little bit. Um, so, uh, so, so, yeah, I, I had no clue. But see, these riddles, they were not written so that you would be unable to find the hidden medallion. Uh, but to those who had ears to hear, they were actually meant to lead you right to it. That which was hidden was only hidden so that it might be found. But you had to listen to clues very carefully. You had to have ears to hear, for if you missed one clue, you could have wound up on the other side of town. And so, too, when you listen to the parables of Jesus, you must, have, uh, must pay close attention and even have the key to understanding. So in Mark 4, 24 to 25, Jesus says to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure that you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. If you pay attention, if, if you listen closely, uh, even to that degree in which you are figuring out, even more will be added to you. It's kind of like similar to those riddles. If you got the first one, the first one then built on the second one. Uh, and then if you got the second one, it helped you to the third one, leading you all the way to the medallion. Well, uh, likewise, you need to pay close attention, but for to the one who has... More will be given. Yes, more understanding. And from the one who has not, even what he has, that would be me, would be taken away. Even if I got one piece or part of it, I couldn't understand how it all fit together. So even the knowledge that I did have uh, had just completely amounted to nothing because I never found the medallion, uh, nor did I even understand enough to even go out to know where to begin to look. Now, that's with riddles, but what Jesus is talking about here is parables. So in 24 to 25, we're told to pay attention to the parables, to the teachings of Christ. It is not enough that we just hear them, but that we would understand them, lest even what we do grasp be taken away, and the life and growth that we've had would just shrivel up and die. See, for this saying of giving more to those who have and taking away from those who have not is a direct application, I believe, to the parable that Jesus was just explaining to the disciples. For when all the crowds and the scribes and the Pharisees were gathered, they all heard the same parable on the seashore. The same exact message was proclaimed to all of them. The same seed, if you will, or message was being preached to all of them. However, the parable itself was describing the different soils of their hearts, not different seeds. So all heard the same message, but not all had the same understanding. And this was intentional, says Jesus in Mark 4, 10 to 12. He actually tells his disciples this intention, the intentionality with this. When he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him, remember, about the parables. And he said to them, to you, it has been given, look, watch this, uh, it's singular, the secret of the kingdom of God. We see secrets in, in Luke And in Matthew, Mark here specifically is highlighting the individual one secret, the secret or the key, which I believe is Christ, uh, of the kingdom of God. And the reason why I say that is because look what he says right after that. For, but for those who are outside, now to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those who are outside, outside of what? But outside of Christ. For those who are outside, everything is in parables. It remains confusing to them, dark to them. They don't, they don't get it. It is concealed so that they may indeed uh, see, but they don't perceive. They indeed hear, but they do not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. If they knew who I was, they would be repenting of what they've said about me. That means that there's actually intentionality with the parables that actually leaves some as a seal to their unbelief. It is almost as a a seal to their uh, rebellion and their sin against God. And therefore to others who seek out the Lord, who understand and begin repenting 
uh, forgiveness is made possible for them. Thus, the prophetic warning is here in verse 23. Uh, in Mark 4, 23, it says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, this sounds just like a common saying. We, we see it in Revelation to the way we're churches. Jesus says it there. Jesus uses it often throughout the, um, the, the Gospels. But this is a very Old Testament wording. This is the, this is the word that prophets would, would use when they bring forth a warning to the people. When they would call the people of God back to trying to call them away from their sin and away from worshiping false gods and trying to call them back to God as prophets would go out, they would use this word. Anyone who has ears to hear, let them hear. So if they don't and they do not repent, if they do not turn away from their sins, then they would experience the judgment of God like us do our sin. So therefore Jesus quotes here, this is a quote from Isaiah 6, so you guys might remember Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 is that awesome passage in Scripture where Isaiah is caught up into this vision of the Lord. And the, he sees the Lord high and exalted, high and lifted up. And, and so much so that his, the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. And there are angels that are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And what does he say uh, afterwards? But that I am a man, I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. I don't even deserve to be in your presence. Presence. I, I have unclean lips, I live amongst the people with unclean lips. And then what happens next is that an angel goes and grabs the coal from the altar, right? And places it upon his lips and says, your sins have been atoned for, right? His lips, my unclean lips, signifying the forgiveness of his sin. And then afterwards, after that had happened, then Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, 8, he hears the voice of the Lord saying, now whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I, Isaiah, said, here I am, Lord, send me. This should be our prayer as well. After atonement and forgiveness of this holy God should be, oh, Lord, I will go anywhere for you. But check out the, the ministry, if you will, that he gives to this preacher, Isaiah. Uh, he says to Isaiah, go and say to this people, that is the people of Israel, keep on hearing, sound familiar? Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand, therefore, look at the connection, hearing with the ears and understanding with their hearts and turn and be healed. Now, that's a, uh, an odd saying. Imagine having that sort of ministry saying, go out to this people but, uh, and, and preach repentance to them. However, as you're preaching to them, they're not going to receive you. You're not going to have one single convert, right? Um, I mean, denominations would stop supporting church plants if there's not a single convert, right? This is telling Isaiah, and this is from the Lord, that he would go forth and that he would preach this word, but that nobody would hear him. As a matter of fact, it would be as a sealing to them of their disobedience. It would be a, a heavying of their ears and a blinding of their eyes, lest they would see, hear, understand in their hearts, turn from their sin and be forgiven. See, this is the people of Israel. As they had been worshiping false gods over and over again, and over and over again, God would send prophets to them to tell them, repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and follow me, and follow me alone. But they kept doing away with the prophets, not listening to them. They would be oppressing the poor and oppressing the widows and, and, and oppressing the foreigners. They, there was no justice in the land. And they did not love God nor worship him as God. And so what God is saying to Isaiah is go and preach to them. And what will happen is they will be taken captive by the Babylonians. And that is exactly what happens to Israel and Judah. And he says it right here. Because Isaiah says, how long shall I go forth uh, preaching this. And he said, keep on preaching until the cities lie waste without inhabitant, houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So a huge destruction over all the people of Israel and yet only a stump would remain, which would be the holy seed or the holy remnant uh, of the people. Which I would even argue in this time, when Jesus is there, all of Israel likewise ha had gone astray. 
And Jesus was the only faithful one of Israel, the only faithful king who obeyed Yahweh in all of his ways, meditated upon his word in all of his heart, and obeyed him in all things. He was the only faithful and obedient holy seed, which is the stump. So the people would not believe Isaiah, right? But they would continue in their disobedience. And thus the people of Israel, even now as Jesus was preaching to them, that preaching would be a sealing of their judgment, And they would go, in the Old Testament, into captivity for not trusting God and living exclusively for the Lord. And even now, uh, the disciples themselves, along with the scribes and Pharisees, do not understand what Jesus is saying when he's preaching these parables to them. They're having a, a hardness of hearing. They're having a hardness of understanding. And so Jesus is saying, if you don't get this parable, you're not going to be able to get any parables. For all Israel at that time had gone astray. Even after the Babylonian captivity, when Yahweh brings his people back, there's a, there's a return from exile. But even after the return from exile, they begin to worship false gods still. And by Jesus' day, all had fallen away yet again and were now, as a people, just as much enemies of God. And I really want to highlight that. They were being just as much enemies of God as were the Egyptians of old. Thus, the prophetic word and warning from Jesus Everyone who has ears to hear, let them hear. For all of Israel, if they did not repent, they would suffer the just wrath of God, do their sin and rebellion. They were as rebellious, I'll say it again, as the Gentiles, as much an enemy of God as the Egyptians. We saw this two weeks ago in chapter 3, right? The scribes and the Pharisees called Jesus God in the flesh. They called Jesus possessed by the devil, And saying that he is doing the works of Satan. Jesus, God in the flesh. The same God who delivered Israel out of the land of Egypt. Shining light when he did that onto his people. And darkness onto the enemies of God. Which is very important for our passage today. Because Jesus says the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. Though for some it is being concealed in darkness. And to other the secret is being given. And the light is shining showing in their understanding. In Mark 1.15, that's what Jesus says. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, what? Like a good prophet, repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand, but although proclaimed to all, it's at the same time mysteriously concealed. But the key to understanding the parables and understanding the mystery of the kingdom of God, as we learned last week, is Jesus himself. So Mark 4.11, he said to them, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, which is Christ himself. But for those who are outside of me, everything is going to remain in parables. The commentator uh, from the New Pillar, New Testament uh, commentary picks up on this as well. He says, the clue to receiving the mystery of the kingdom of God is found in Jesus. Those who are with Jesus and do the will of God, remember from that passage in 3 uh, chapter 3, 34 to 35, where he says, no, those who do the will of God are my mothers and brothers, sisters, uh, are the insiders in whom the mystery of God is revealed. And those who are not with Jesus are outsiders for whom the parable seals their unbelief. They're already unbelieving. They're already disobeying. They're already in rebellion, and the parables are sealing that. The parable of the sower is like the cloud that is now separating the fleeing Israelites from the pursuing Egyptians, bringing darkness to the one side and light to the other. Now what he's referring to, since we're Exodus Church, we should probably check this out. What he's referring to is Exodus 14, uh, 19 and 20, when it says, Then the angel of the Lord, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and then went behind them. So therefore now he's right in the middle between the pursuing um, Egyptians, now that he moved behind them, and the Israelites would be in front. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. Therefore, there was the cloud and darkness, darkness over Egypt and the Egyptians pursuing, and it lit up the night on the Israelite side without one coming near to the other the entire time, all night. So there's a division, and what is it but God himself who's going before his people, God himself who now brings this division. See, that which was blindness to the Egyptians 
to Egypt was revelation to Israel. The same event was either a vehicle of light, says this commentator, or of darkness, depending on one's stance with God, which is exactly what is happening on the seashore. Think Red Sea, Exodus imagery here, on the seashore as Jesus, who is Yahweh in the flesh, is there in the boat, here again to rescue his people from the kingdom of darkness and to bring them into the kingdom of light, if indeed they would repent of their sins and turn and follow uh, that cloud, if they would follow that light, which is Jesus himself, Yahweh himself in the flesh, the one who's come to set his people free, but not from Pharaoh, but from the slavery of sin, the one who has come to lead them as he did before, by the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, if only they had eyes to see that light and ears to hear him. They need not know a new message, what they, and neither do we. They need the gospel. They need Christ. And we don't need a new message. What's needed, what they need and what we need is new soil, a new heart. The need is for ears to hear, and Christ has come to give them and us, hearts of understanding, so that we might know that he is indeed Yahweh in the flesh and him who we must follow. For all who will not have Jesus will not have the kingdom of God. See, all who would reject the light and remain apart from Christ would likewise remain in darkness. But the lamp has come. The lamp has come into the world to give light and life to those who are trapped in darkness. And for many people in here, you could say, amen. See, the lamp has come, and we see that in verse 21. This is really cool. I want to show this to you. So Mark 4, 21. Jesus says to them, is a lamp brought in in order to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? Right, And then goes on to talk about, for that which is hidden is going to be made manifest, that which is secret will be brought to light. Well, this is one of those times where not knowing Greek would would cause you to miss this key in the puzzle. Now, you can get it from the overall context, so you don't all need to go study Greek, but I would say that you should have your pastors, whether this church or another, always have at least a working knowledge of it. Because it's a really cool thing that Mark does here that you would otherwise miss. See, the, trans, the, the word translated here as brought is not what Mark says. If he wanted to say brought, he could. He could say that the lamp was brought in, and he would use the word ago. Now, I'm going to throw it up on the screen, so now you all know a little bit of Greek, okay? Um, ago, which means to lead, to carry, or to bring. Everybody say ago. You even speak Greek. This is wonderful. Um, so ago, which means to lead, to carry, or to bring. Now, he doesn't use the word ago. He uses the word erkamai, and you can hit the next slide, erkamai, which you can see means to come, to arrive, or to enter in. Now, this is important because Luke and Matthew say that a lamp is brought in, and which is fine if you're just talking about parables, um, and, and that's what they're trying to highlight is the fact that, that parables, and, and that is true, are, 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 are hidden, but shall one day be revealed. However, Mark intentionally, I would say, this is not a difference in manuscript. I'm saying he's intentionally doing this in order to show a point to us who have ears to hear, let them hear. He switches the word and makes um, the lamp change from being brought in to coming in itself. He's actually saying that the, as if the lamp grew legs and is walking into the room, has, the lamp has come or the lamp has arrived, or the lamp has entered in. He intentionally changes from the objective being brought into the subjective, the one who's doing the action, who is entering, who is coming in, for the purpose not of being placed under a bed or hidden under a blanket or a basket, but in order to be placed on a stand and to shine light to all. Now, some commentators miss this altogether. Others see it and call this syntax awkward. Why is he doing this? Because he's seeming to personify a lamp during a proverbial saying, and it's not a parable. So some see this, however, and as do I, as the very key to what Mark has been talking about the entire time. If you do not understand 
all of the scriptures, as we learned last week, as pointing to Jesus, then even PhDs will scratch their heads while reading a gospel about the life of Jesus. For Mark makes his point clear and says it's not just a lamp, he even uses the definite article, it is the lamp which has come. The lamp is God himself. And this is not the first time that Yahweh has been compared to a lamp. In 2 Samuel twenty two twenty nine. He says, for you are my lamp, O Lord. For you are my lamp, O Yahweh, and my God lightens my darkness. If anyone gathering around the boat, that boat as Christ was teaching them, wanted more knowledge, wanted more understanding, wanted to leave the darkness, wanted, wanted to have light to shine into their life, into their souls, they must Go to Jesus, the lamp who has come. And what is true of them is true for us. Those who do not continue to grow in their knowledge of Jesus and even repent of the things that maybe we've said about him before or those here who have said about him before, those whose roots do not go deep into Christ and to his word will one day, as the parable says, wither and die and fall away. And they shall remain forever in the dark. And even what knowledge that they do have, though they grasp maybe a little bit of some now, will one day just be taken away. For the lamp, though veiled in flesh, right? The lamp is in some way veiled, as are the parables, veiled in flesh, is being revealed, will one day towards the end of the Gospels fully be revealed, and will then afterwards be proclaimed. You see, the Gospel of Mark, Mark is working us through, through an unfolding of who Jesus is and is describing the falling away of the crowds likened to the cutting off of Israel, even back in Isaiah. The scribes and the Pharisees are in the dark like the Egyptians back in Exodus 14 and are having the words of Christ bouncing off the hardness of their sinful hearts and snatched away by Satan, the parable. And those crowds who keep coming to him and getting all excited about miracles or exorcisms will no longer follow him once persecution rises and the heat of the sun is just too much. And it's not fun anymore. We've seen many people having this with us, going from youth groups and playing dodgeball, you know, to then going to college and leaving the faith altogether. See people striving with Christ for a while and difficulty arising and then no longer able to take it once persecution comes. See, they shall either wither and die off, says the parables, and some disciples, like Pastor Kyle, all this was said last week, uh, like Pastor Kyle said, Judas will even receive the word and follow Christ, but then get choked out by the love of the world and the desire for riches and even betray Jesus for silver. But to those who have been chosen to be given the secret of the kingdom of God. Those who have Christ, and better yet, are had by Christ, will endure through all hardships. Feel like you're in dark times right now? Know this. If you have Christ, better yet, if Christ has you, you shall endure through all persecutions, all trials, all dark times in your life, and you shall bear fruit, especially in those times if you just continue to pay attention to him, continue to look for him, continue to search after him, even after all the crowds and even here we at church depart, that you continue to seek him, continue to know him, and to know him more and more, so shall you bear fruit more and more, 30, 60, even 100 fold to the sower who has sold that, sowed that gospel into you. Now, I'm already kind of getting into it, but what about us? How does this really uh, pertain to us? Well, I believe that, that we are a hard, hard, hard-hearted people. I believe that I'm a hard-hearted person. We get bored with the Word of God. We'd rather stare at our phones for hours and grow weary of putting our face in His book. We skip out on church since we're not saved by works. We therefore starve ourselves from the buffet offered in studying God's word. We grow thirsty while offered living water. We get too busy and skip out on community group because surely something better has come up or just too busy for the things of God. And it starves us 
from hearing his word. And then even as we hear his word, it begins to bounce off our, our hard soil. See, we're a hard-hearted people, but we need the soil of our hearts to be tilled by the spirit of God. Amen? I mean, how will we endure and not fall away like others during trials or during our own sinful desires that lead us astray or during dark times as the psalmist this morning in Psalm 43, oh my God, where are you? Where are you? I'm in turmoil. Where are you, my God? So what would cause us to endure? But the light of the glory, which is in Jesus Christ, who is the lamp that has come into the world to save sinners like you and like me and to transform our hearts of stone and till our hearts again and again and we should ask him to do so, to continuously till our hearts uh, which are so hardened by the deceitfulness of our sin and the weakness of our flesh. Lord, over and over again, till my heart and plant your word deep inside of me so that we might even week after week confess our sins and then break forth Uh, in worship when we say, oh Lord, you are my lamp. Oh Yahweh, my God, lightens my darkness. Amen? You see, the light was, the lamp was clothed in flesh. His glory was veiled. However, the lamp that has come into the world to give light and life to all men shall shine at its brightest at the end of Mark's gospel when placed on a stand that is lifted up upon the cross. When the fullness of God's justice do our sin and his love for his bride is most on display. And at that point, all doubt is removed. If you even have doubt or in darkness this morning, look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. Come to the cross and look unto Jesus and know that your God has died for your sin and has come to ransom and redeem you. And even you, like that Roman soldier, he couldn't even help but say, surely he was the son of God. By the end of the Gospels, the disciples afterwards, after Jesus' resurrection, they were commissioned. Having seen the glory of God in the resurrected Christ, now this secret of the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, in this Gospel shall be heralded now across the world. That which was hidden shall be fully made known, transforming our hearts and theirs. And even Mark shall show us the glory of Christ in the same way as he was disclosed to him in a parabolic-natured gospel that concealed in order to reveal, showing all who have ears to hear that Jesus is our Savior and our King. So as of now, we're moving through Mark, and we're still in Mark 4, and Jesus is speaking in parables. The truth is being hidden to the masses who depart from Christ and revealed only to those who leave all to follow him. And for those who would not follow Jesus as their redeemer and savior, nor bow down to him as their king and creator, would remain in darkness. See, we cannot have the teachings of Jesus apart from the person of Jesus. And all God's people can say, amen. For if you do not truly know him, even what you do know will amount to nothing. Trials and tribulations will come and and you'll fall away. But for those of you who know the truth and have had your hearts tilled into good soil by the Spirit of God and have received and believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the lamp has come and has died for your sins, and at his resurrection he has also now given you new life in him, then you shall continue to grow and increase and bear much fruit to him who sowed sowed the seed of the gospel in you. And we shall proclaim what has been hidden and shining light into all the darkness and into this world. See, to you who have Christ, even more of him shall be given to you. Therefore, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and it will be open to you. Seek and you will find. So I'll end with this final truth and exhortation. The truth is this, that we have been redeemed by this lamp who has come. We have been redeemed by him, by Jesus Christ, to know him. And then to make him known. He wants you to know him. He wants you to pursue him. And if you do, then to the measure at which you do, more shall be added to you. For we have been redeemed by him to know him more and more and to make him known even to the ends of this earth. I promise you the more you know, the more you're going to want to tell. 
and I'll close with this exhortation, for you just to take every opportunity to learn more of God's word. And in the days to come, seek out a mentor. If you've never had one before, if you had one in the past, seek out a mentor, but make sure that this mentor who, who, whom you're seeking advice for and knowledge of the word for, make sure that that person as well knows God and is likewise walking close with Jesus. Seek out a mentor. And also, that, that's one thing you could do. Another thing would be uh, join us on August 2nd, as we've even entitled it, The Glory of Kings, right? Who search out the things which seem to be concealed, how to read your Bible. So we want to make that possible for you. So even if you've never had a class in that, we're going to start from square one. That's August 2nd. You can even um, reply to that, RSVP to that through Facebook or online. So as we search out, what's the purpose of it? Not just an intellectual exercise, right? been redeemed by him to know him and know him, uh, not just his teachings, but his person. I promise you, you can't separate the two. And to come back uh, next week, in the next two weeks, we're going to study a couple more parables of the kingdom of God. um, And make sure you pay attention to what you hear and what you listen to. And don't forget the key of all understanding, which is Christ himself. As I said before, if you have anxiety with the teachings of Christ, as you do with corn mazes and escape houses, remember that these sayings, which leave many in the dark, are actually meant to bring us to the end of the tunnel, if indeed we see the light. Let's pray.